coming to you from Jezero Crater on the surface of Mars. This is Mr. C. Eighth graders, happy Thursday to you. And um, hey, you know Ingenuity's number one job, actually two jobs, right? The helicopter or Martian helicopter. What's it supposed to do? What's it designed to do? Not to fall down and go boom, not crash. And to take photos of the surface of Mars. So my job today is to get you ready for your test tomorrow. I've already written most um, for all intents and purposes I have written the test. I just haven't print, you know I haven't typed it out, but um, I've written it. It's 35 points and I'll tell you more. Okay, I might ask you this on the test. I just thought of this. I might ask you this. This is a next generation roller coaster that's being built in Saudi Arabia. It's called, is it Falcon's Flight? Yep. And this is just a digital one. It's going to be uh, go 155 miles an hour. It's going to be taller than the one in New Jersey. It was 456 feet. So this baby is going to be up there. And it is going to go fast. The people who are building it wrote, it will not be for the faint of heart. I guess not. And it will not be for me. So I ain't going on any big roller coaster in this lifetime. Not happening. Now in heaven, maybe I'll have you know some increased ability to handle heights and roller coasters and not spew over everybody in the car that we're riding in together. So maybe I'll have those improved abilities, but not down here. So anyway, and one of the reasons I don't like these roller coasters, I've told you already, is due to inertia. Remember Newton's first law of motion? He said that an object in motion will keep moving in the same direction at the same speed. That's what I don't like. Because when you're in a roller coaster and it's going real fast that way, it's got inertia. So when the track goes that way, what's it going to do? Or what's your body going to do? Your body will want to keep moving that way. I don't like that. And shove you up against the bar and you feel like you're going to fly out and die. So. I don't like that. I don't enjoy that. So, anyway, you can go on the, all the road, roller coaster rides that you want. Okay? Now, I've got to tell you this. You've got some homework first. Your homework were bullet facts. So, if you'll pass that in, that'll be full credit. How many points? 12. Eh, six. Probably six out of six. Out of six. Half a point for each one, probably six. Okay, I don't want to give away too many easy points. So name, date, period on that. Pass it in. Get her in if you didn't get her in. Get her in by tomorrow. I'll be picking everything up on Saturday. Okay, hey Mr. C, on the test, can we use a note card? Yes. Yep. And then I have good news for you. I have further good news. So here's the good news. Hey, if you'll have your journal at the ready, would you? Because you're going to need it. Okay. Here is good news. I'll show it to you. This good news is available to you in RenWeb Thursday night. Thursday, homework notes. See that? Mr. C, did you give us a study guide? I did. All the topics that are on the test are listed right here, and I think I used them all. Thanks. Appreciate that. I used them all. So, um, one way or another, the first topic is force. A force is a push or a pull. So 
How do you know an object is moving? How can you tell? Remember? The object will move in front of reference points that are in the back. back the background. The object will move like my hand is moving in front of my face or the TV behind the computer screen. So that's how you know. Speed. What is speed? What's the definition of speed? It's how much distance an object covers in a given amount of time. That's speed. Do you remember the formula? Speed is distance divided by time. So if you were traveling by car at 120 and you covered 120 miles in two hours, what is your speed, average speed per hour? 120 divided by 2, 60 miles an hour. So, and then velocity. Velocity is your speed in a certain direction. That's velocity, your speed in a given direction. Could be this way, could be that way. How fast you're moving in a certain direction. Then you've got acceleration, speeding up. Slowing down uh -huh, or changing direction, acceleration. And then there's friction. When two forces are touching each other, you've got friction. When the surface of two objects touch each other, friction. Now, four kinds. They cannot be moving. What is that? Static friction. They could be sliding over each other. What is that? Sliding friction. They could be going through the air or water. What is that? Fluid friction. They could be rolling like a wheel. What is that? The rolling friction. So kinds of friction. And then there are two things that two variables that increase the friction or lessen it. And the first one is um, the masses of the object, how hard the surfaces are or smooth, what the surfaces are like. Okay, And then how hard because of their masses, the force between them. If it's a light force, not as much friction, a really hard force, maybe because there's extra mass, more, there'll be more friction. So the two variables that affect friction, are they smooth or rough? What's the surface of the objects like? And the force of the friction between them. Okay, so there's all of that. All right, next is um, Newton's universal law of gravitation. What is it? Every object in the universe attracts every other object. And depending on how much mass they have and how close they are to each other. Their masses, if, say, um, we don't want this to happen, the su let's say the sun developed like double mass. That would not be good. That would mean it would pull us a lot harder, wouldn't it? And also mean or if the Earth pulled us a lot harder, we'd weigh a lot more, wouldn't we? Mass is the amount of matter, atoms, that an object has. Weight is how hard the object's gravity pulls. Uh, so Isaac Newton's universal law of gravitation, every object in the universe, pulls on every other object. The variables that affect the strength of the attraction of the gravity, again, how close the objects are, and their masses. I already gave you mass and weight. Inertia. Inertia is the resistance of an object um, to change. If it's not moving, it'll resist moving. If it is moving, it'll resist stopping. So Newton's first law of motion, also the law of inertia, and it states an object in motion will keep moving unless it's acted upon by a force. Travel at the same speed, same direction. An object that's not moving will, can, will tend to not move unless it's acted upon by a force. Newton's first law. His second law 
is the force that an object has depends on its mass and its speed, its acceleration. The greater the speed, the more force. The greater the mass, more force. Okay? So, there's all of that. Let's see what else I've got. Uh, Newton's second law of motion, we just did. Force equals mass times acceleration. Newton's third law for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Okay? So there's that. Then there's momentum, like in the un unstoppable train trailer, momentum. Momentum is... Um, mass times acceleration. That's momentum. So more massive objects going faster have more momentum, like the train. So anyway, um, free fall. Felix Baumgartner was in free fall for a while, the first minute or two, because he was above the Earth's atmosphere. When the atmosphere started to slow him down, then it wasn't just gravity that was the variable. It was also the force of the atmosphere pushing on him. So, free fall. Centripetal force, a, a, an object that's being spun around, will tend to keep moving in toward the center unless the force is stopped. Then it'll take off in a straight line at the same force. Centripetal force from the word meaning center. Example would be a satellite going around the Earth. It continues to go around the Earth because it's being pulled toward the Earth but the Earth is round so it keeps missing the Earth because it's got a curved path. Now it's got to have just the right speed or it'll either fly away or be pulled in by the Earth. Okay. Um, I already said the jobs of the Martian helicopter, not crash, take photos of Mars. Laura's major message last time, you can do what you practice. Whatever you practice, 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 you'll be able to do. You'll get better and better at it. And then proteins are made of 20 amino acids, which can be reused and make amino acid chains that make up proteins. Anywhere from 150 amino acids all the way up to 35. 4,000, and the chance for just one basic amino acid chain of 150 amino acids forming by itself 1 over 10 to the 164th. So they prove that proteins are designed. Okay, so how we do in time-wise? Pretty good. I wanted to show you this. If you'll take your journal out, this needs to go in your journal. I didn't give you the lake levels. So here they are. For May 1st, because May 1st was on a Saturday. Roosevelt Lake, there it is. Roosevelt's at 76%. About three quarters full. The Salt River um, system, all their lakes are about 80%. Okay, the Salt River watershed, that's good. The Verde River to the north, watershed, not good. Only about a third in the lakes, 32%, so not good. So the total reservoir system, In your journal, huh? Total reservoir system, 74%. So Roosevelt, 76. Total reservoir system, 74. Now we're four, what's the percentage? Gotta get this right. So we are 24%, one fourth below last year at this time. We've got a lot of water several years worth, but we're going to need a nice put back of precipitation in the form of snow next winter, next November, December, and so on. You won't have me then, but 
you ought to be remembering it when you hear things about uh, lake levels and all of that. It's real important because we use that water to do everything. So it's really important. Okay, so check out. So again, check out very closely Thursday's homework notes page in RenWeb. It lists all the topics, and they're all on the test. So I list them, and don't forget your 3 by 5 card. Okay? Hey, turn that homework in if you haven't turned it in, name, date, period. Okay. Hey, raise your hand, hands up if you'd like to have more creativity. No? Who wouldn't? Man, I'm one of the first to put my hand up. I wish I were more creative. There are ways to get more creative. And that's pretty important. Creativity is going to influence every area of your life to come. Creativity. Pretty important. And that's why I'm having daughter Laura come by and give you four or five tips how to be more creative. They'll be on next week's quiz. No test next, next week for you, but a quiz. And they'll be on there. So stick them in your journal, three or four tips that will help you become more creative. I'll be paying attention to this. So even though I don't have as long um, to spend on the planet as you do, whatever years I get, I'd like to be more creative. I'd like to be. So in your journal, section on creativity and some bullet facts, how to get more creative. I think you're going to find it interesting. And I'll be, I will see you, because you're doing the test tomorrow, so I'll see you on Monday when we'll review for the semester exam. Hi, this is Your Magnificent Brain Learning with Laura. And this is going to be our final episode that's not a review, um, final lecture. Um, and I wanted to do it on creativity because one, it's something that we hear talked about a lot and yet we're never really given any instruction on how creativity works unless we seek it out. And I say creativity not as there are creative people and not creative people, but it's instead a skill. And it's a skill that you can work at, um, almost like a muscle that you can get stronger at with practice and with effort over time. And the reason why I think that's important is creativity is necessary if we want to innovate anything. So basically making something better by thinking outside what's been previously done. Um, and also for problem solving. So when we come up against something that we've never seen before and we have to figure out a way through, creativity can help us with that. So I wanted to start out by giving a story. Um, when I was in my early 20s, I was working in Air, Scotland. Um, I had my own apartment there for the time that I was working and I was basically um, helping in an office where the account manager who normally works uh, in supporting these accounts was going to be going on vacation. So I was going to be filling in. I arrived, we had the handoff, everything went well, I got settled into my apartment, and then on Saturday, of the, the week that he was going on vacation, I ended up having a shower, and as I was trying to get out of the bathroom, the handle actually snapped off. These doors were of a unique making in that basically it had a deadbolt, so when it was in the closed position, you couldn't get it open any other way than turning the handle. It snapped off, I was stuck in the bathroom, <laughs> A little bit panicked looking around for what was with me um, I didn't have a phone I basically just had my facial cleanser which had a pump I had shampoo and conditioner soap I had a, sh a razor 
all kind of the normal bath stuff. And I had to figure out, with this handle broken off, and I attempted many different ways of reattaching it and getting it to turn, and none of those worked, I had to figure out how to basically MacGyver my way out of this bathroom. Because no one was going to be checking on me on Monday if I wasn't in the office. So what I did was I went, took stock, did a lot of deep breathing, took stock of what I had, and I found that actually the tube from my cleanser, from the pump, fit perfectly, which totally was a god thing. But it fit perfectly. I was able to basically using that and using the handle that broke off, I was able to kind of fit it back together so that enough so I could get it to turn. And what I'd say is creativity is just that type of experience. Often you need it when you need it, you can't necessarily plan for it, and you just have to look at what you have and try to think outside the box of how these things could work together to create a solution. But also taking a deep breath and getting out of your automatic processing about the way you normally think can help you. And so that flows into really our brain processing systems, we have two systems in play. We have the automatic one, the one that can think fast. So for instance, if someone's driving a car and has to stop quickly, they do so automatically. It may not even be like registering in their brain by the time their their body is acting. Our, our brains are amazing in that it can make assessments so quickly that often before those signals even you know, merge together, all of a sudden we're taking action. And that's great. Those things are important. But when we're trying to be creative, when we're trying to look past what the standard or the normal is, using fast and automatic thinking actually isn't conducive to creative and innovative uh, solutions. So the other system that we have, the first one is fast and automatic response. The second one is slow and it's logical and it has kind of a deeper level of thought behind it. And in order to engage that, really you have to kind of disconnect from the quick level of thinking. Often by finding a quiet place, that doesn't have a lot of stimuli going on, doing some deep breathing to tell yourself you're in a safe space, that you're able to think creatively, that you're not having to respond quickly or rapidly to stimulus coming after and coming at you. So something like some people like going to a quiet space with not a lot of bright lights. But some people might like going to a place that actually has conversations going on that they can kind of zone out and focus in on what it is they're doing. So figuring out how best you work creatively is definitely something important. It's something to listen to yourself. It's something to recognize when, if you're working on a problem and you keep being distracted by different things around you, that's probably not the optimal place to be or the optimal environment for yourself. So just pay attention to that, of how you work best. And then try to experiment with, okay, do I like music in the background with no words? Do I like utter silence? Do I like decent lighting? Do I like kind of more mellow lighting? Figuring out how you work best when you're trying to create. But in addition to that, how we actually create is from the things that our brain already knows or is seeing or is hearing about. So we can't create if we're unaware of and if we don't have any experience with the problem set in which we're working. Often though, we 
no matter where we go, even if it's a unique problem set in an area that we've never ventured into, um, we often have experience that we can take from other areas and it will apply, even though we've never experienced this specific area. Life actually allows us to gain a lot of experience, a lot of just ideas for how the world could work, of innovations that we could try, and seeing what other people do, especially what other creative solutions are, can kind of sometimes spark what it is that we're trying to move forward in. So, say that you're interested in getting into a specific field, when you listen to other creative people within that field talk about their solutions, it kind of frees up your mind to both learn, but also start getting an idea of what boundaries could be stretched and what areas could I kind of move into and try out new things. When we create, typically what we do is we do three different things with what we already know with the information that we already have interconnected in our brain. So just random knowledge and our subconscious moving back and forth, tapping into it. What we do when we create is we either bend what's already there. So for instance, there's an artist who basically took pictures over a year of this same view but with different light filters and in different kind of weather conditions. So it's the same view each and every time, but each one is also unique because he did different things with each one. He bent that view in unique and different ways. The next one is breaking. So we can break apart something to find additional meaning. So for instance, Picasso is a great example. His art broke apart all of these different shapes and created new images with those shapes. Ones that we could see what the shapes are, but then when put together they create a different picture. And then lastly is blending. That would be what we would typically call a mashup when you have two songs that are integrated together and all of a sudden you get this new song that has a new profound meaning, that's what blending is. Bringing two things together and creating something new out of those things. I talk about it in terms of artistic examples, but this is also what we do when we're creating solutions. We bend what's already there. We break it apart and find new solutions by piecing new things together or even looking at, okay, can we cut out some steps that aren't necessary? We blend things together by finding something, maybe even from an area that's unconnected with what we're doing, but when we blend it with what we already know, it creates a new solution. So all of these things about creativity and how it works leads me to how do we tap into that in a way that really is effective and useful. And one of the best, really the best sources of advice that I've seen as I've started to move more into creative fields um, is actually from Pixar's Storytellers. They have 22 um, tips for writing stories or 22 rules for story writing and these two rules are actually very effective for any type of creative endeavor any type of problem solving and the first one is that you write down everything that it isn't so basically if you are trying to solve a problem and all you can find are all the things that aren't solutions write all of those down because then you can get the things that don't work out of your mind. It then gets it on paper, you see that it's there, you'll see that it's tried, and you can move on to the things that you need to try next. So make a list of everything it isn't. The second one 
is don't try the first thing or the second thing or the third thing that comes to mind. So basically make a list and remember that the first really one to five things you come up with in your list of ideas of brainstorming are probably going to be obvious. They're probably not going to be innovated, innovative. But once you get down to your sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth idea in how to solve this problem, then you start to really get outside the box. Probably getting into what hasn't been tried yet. You might have some off the wall ideas, but the more brainstorming you do beyond that obvious point, the more likely you'll get an innovative solution that can meet your need while also not being something that necessarily um, has been tried or is potentially outdated as well. And then as I was connecting with all of those ideas of creativity, I kind of re-remembered that in order to be creative, we do have to put ourselves out there. We have to go outside the box. We have to try different things, which means that we have to be okay with making a mistake or having an idea that not everyone likes or even necessarily thinks is good and reminding yourself that making, coming up with ideas that aren't the perfect ones actually is part of that creative generation process. It's, there's not anything wrong with coming up and brainstorming something that isn't the right thing because it helps you get to what could be the right thing. And then in, addi in addition to that, Make sure that you even create a safe space for yourself to try to make those mistakes. Don't shut down ideas. Don't let your inner critic tell you what has value and what doesn't without trying it first. Often we have ideas and we're like, oh, well, that will never work because of this thing and that thing. Be open. See what's possible. Write down things without any type of judgment, without any type of kind of self-editing, and just keep moving forward and then just see what works. Try things. It's like a, you know, a research experiment. Keep just trying things with different variables and see what ends up being possible and functional. And I wanted to say that learning how to push through when something gets difficult, when learning how to slow down your thinking, learning how to start to push yourself out of the box. It may take more time and effort and energy, but it will be worth it. It will be a skill that you'll be able to use in many different areas. And as many economists and um, people in the occupation sectors say, it's one of those skills that's gonna be vital um, in the years to come. I hope that this information was helpful. Um, I've really enjoyed having these these times to share um, some of what I know um, and to have these lectures. I will be coming back one more time as a kind of review right before the final. I'll be sharing or re re um, reminding you of several things that um, I think are important and things that you want to remember going forward. But I also personally wanted to challenge you um, as you go into summer, try something unique. Try to come up with creative ideas. Try a new hobby. Try to learn something new. Really work on pushing the boundaries of your brain and what you can learn and do. I'd I'd recommend you reconsider what's possible. I hope that um, you have a great rest of your day and I will talk to you in another two weeks.